South Africa, Thursday, December 9th, 1982. Under cover of darkness, in the early hours of Thursday morning, a force of over 100 South African commandos made an airborne attack on African National Congress refugees living in exile in Masiru, capital of Lesotho. Firing machine guns and hurling grenades, some disguised in Basutu blankets, their faces blackened, the attackers unleashed death and destruction as they laid waste 12 selected targets in the residential areas of the city. With the approaching dawn, the raiders were airlifted out of Lesotho's capital, leaving behind a trail of devastated buildings, a shattered community and a stunned nation. The South African Defence Force claimed a preemptive military victory against ANC bases in Masiru and issued the following statement. There can be little doubt that those killed in the attack were hardened ANC terrorists who were planning to carry out sabotage and terror in South Africa. Shocked eyewitness accounts told a different story. Most of the victims had been slaughtered in their beds. Others were taken outside and shot. The dead included five women and two children. Stunned by the horror of this onslaught, Red Cross worker Lorna Guthrie gave a first-hand account of the aftermath of the attack. Then I noticed the windows were broken and the frames charred. Inside, smoke rose from a pile of debris, which included a human hip bone. The man in the house had been taken by South African soldiers, wrapped in a blanket and set on fire. The house had then been devastated by incendiary devices. In another house, three small children owe their lives to their 13-year-old sister. She made them lie on the floor and put a mattress over them and then lay on the mattress. When the soldiers came in, she was shot and killed. The three younger children were not found and survived. In another house, Soldiers stormed the building and killed the wife. They then went to the bed, pulled back the blankets and found a four-year-old child alone there. He was shot and killed. The father was then killed in another room. A total of 42 people, including five women and two children, lose their lives in the onslaught. In the ghetto townships of South Africa, the black community is outraged. Of the 42 people killed, 12 are Basutu citizens, three South African students, and 27 African National Congress exiles, refugees living openly in Masiru with their Basutu neighbors. In a similar raid in January 1981, South African Defense Force commandos crossed into Mozambique, killing 30 African National Congress exiles at Matola, 15 kilometers outside of the capital city of Maputo. The victims of these terror raids are exiled members of the black South African community, forced to seek refuge in the neighboring African states of Lesotho, Swaziland, Botswana, and Mozambique. With the increasing intensity of state reprisals aimed at suppressing the growing resistance to the apartheid design within the country, the flow of young black exiles from South Africa continues. In Lesotho alone, there are 11,500 South African exiles registered with the United Nations High Commission for Refugees. For black South Africans, December the 16th is Heroes Day, the commemoration of those who have died in the struggle for liberation in South Africa. Taking place in the shadow of recent bloodshed, this year it is a day of mourning, a painful revelation of the violent horror of escalating civil war. We have met this morning. At St. Augustine's We've Chapel in Orlando today. East, Soweto, Reverend Buti Klagale leads the Not service. So much to mourn the slaughter of our fellow countrymen on a foreign territory. 
for once more to rededicate ourselves and to commit ourselves to this business of ours of regaining this land. And so this morning, for this couple of hours, we will call on God's name. We will seek inspiration. We will strengthen one another. Because this is a time of war and that we cannot run away from. Synonymous with the struggle for liberation in South Africa is the African National Congress. Crushed by state banning orders and the imprisonment of its leaders in 1960, the movement has survived in exile under the leadership of Oliver Tambo, long the inspiration of freedom songs, expressing the determination of a people to be free. Community and church leaders address the gathering, giving expression to the outrage of the community. People, my 79-year mother went over the border to go and see her children's children. And it's people like that who have died and who we remember on this occasion. Bishop Simeon Nkonani. That, that is caused by racism. Apartheid deceives other people with a different color of skin to think that they are superior to you. And that is nonsense, utter rubbish. As a priest of God, I say that is utter rubbish. And they must change this system immediately because, look, apartheid is a Frankenstein. And it's apartheid that's gone to Lesotho to kill those children. And it's, and, it's, and it's apartheid that is trembling down upon you and I. Together with democratic people's organizations within South Africa, the church, in accordance with its Christian mandate, plays a vital role in the struggle, consistently challenging the iniquity of apartheid policy and speaking out on behalf of a voiceless community. Reverend Francois Bill. We are here to honor and to pay tribute to those who died in Maseru. Yes, we're coming here to commemorate them and in one sense we mourn, but in another sense we must honor the sacrifice that they have made. So often when we are confronted with the horror of death and stunned by its unreasonableness, we say to ourselves, this is known only to God. It is in his hands. And we say of the people who have died, it was their time. Their time had come. But I want to ask you, my brothers and sisters, can we really say when we face this kind of tragedy that their time had come? No. Do you realize that if we say that, we make of God then an accomplice of the people who rule this land at present. We make God an accomplice of that murder. But God is not like that. This God is the God who is found in the hungry child who has been discarded in the resettlement camps. The God who is sitting with the refugees, exiled. The God who knows the bitterness of being himself an exile. This is the God whom we worship. And it is this God who says to the people who rule and who are in authority, I am a God of justice. And all the things that go by in Jerusalem, in Pretoria, do not go by unnoticed. Your time is coming, and I will require your payment. The yoke is heavy. United, we must pull together. 
nor do we fear the threat of detention, for we shall attain our freedom no matter what. With two generations of apartheid serving to isolate whites from all but the most superficial contact with blacks, South Africa is a nation divided by ignorance, fear, and racial prejudice. While blacks commemorate Heroes Day, white South Africa celebrates the Day of the Vow, symbolized by the Fuertrecker Monument outside Pretoria, legitimizing their claim of the God-given right to self-determination, a euphemism for apartheid, and the strategy designed to maintain white sovereignty and preserve Afrikaner heritage through black oppression. Instilled with the constant fear of a mythical, communist-inspired total onslaught bent on destroying the sacred fabric of South African life, white South Africa reacts with a confused and obsessive perspective to the morass of problems created by apartheid ideology. Government action taken in perpetuating apartheid strategy is legitimized in the name of state security. Through censorship, selective and slanted reporting, the state employs its most powerful servant to justify and endorse the official point of view, and in so doing, further obscures the painful realities of the South African crisis. Good evening. The United States says it considers the African National Congress to be an African nationalist organization which is seeking to replace the present government of South Africa through violence as well as other means. In a statement issued by the State Department, the United States government says it continues to support the process of peaceful evolutionary change in South Africa and to encourage those who in word and deed promote such change. The statement says the government deplores violence from any quarter and therefore categorically condemns all terrorist and other violent acts committed by the ANC or its members. The Minister of Foreign Affairs and Information, Mr. Pickborta, says the United Nations Security Council has gone against the UN Charter and against the facts in deciding to blame South Africa for last week's attack on ANC targets in Mizeru. The Security Council unanimously... Polarized by apartheid, basking in comfortable ignorance, white South Africans are the victims of a dangerous deception. Several thousand people, old and young, attended Day of the Vow meetings throughout the country. At the ceremony at Blood River, the head of the security police, General Johan Kutsia, said there were people on the political right and left wings who were out to destroy the fabric of South African society. Just as the communists would fail in their aims, so too would far right wing exclusivists. <laughs> die rechtvaardigheid van die aanwending van geweld om verandering teweeg te brengen is aan die orde van die dag. En hoe heilig is daar zelfs diegene in ons land wat niet heiver om geweld in die naam van die evangelie te verkondigen. nie. To give further substance to this mass deception and ultimately to defend the privileged status quo against its own oppressed people, for the minority regime, military preparedness is a top priority. South African troops are tough, well-trained and confident of their superiority, allaying white fear about internal strife and the threat of external aggression. Local production of military hardware by South Africa's Arms Corps has enabled the South African Defence Force to build up a formidable arsenal of sophisticated weapons, tailor-made for guerrilla warfare. South Africa now possesses one of the world's deadliest artillery systems, and the NATO publication 15 Nations reviewed the latest G6 gun as one of the finest of its kind in the world. At a cost of 8,5 million rand per day, this formidable military machine has more kill power than the total military might of sub-Saharan black Africa. Obsessed by the illusion of the total onslaught, this show of invincible might offers the guarantee of continued white supremacy and black exclusion from meaningful participation in the political decision-making process of South Africa. Let us also salute those who have fallen and those who continue to, to buy freedom with their lives. 
let us salute those, those whom the government of this land consider to be the enemy. Let us salute those organizations that relentlessly dedicate themselves to freeing their own people. How many Matolas will there be before things are right in this country? How many Maserus will there be before things are right in this country? You are delaying this question because you're so splintered. Reverend Lebamang Sibidi, member of the Soweto Committee of Ten and outspoken critic of the institutional church in South talk Africa. About liberation, to talk about freedom for this country, you're wasting your time and breath until you are determined, each and every one of you, that you are one, that you are one. You are being oppressed not because you are Zanyu or Azapo, you are being oppressed because you're black in this country. <laughs> when will you realize this? When will you realize that 42 people died because we are delaying this by your splintering and warring and inter knee sign fighting? When will this come to an end? This is what they are saying to us. This is what they are saying to us. And if their message should come to our hearts today, and God gives us the grace to accept this message, we'll be free tomorrow. Amanda. <laughs> Mandela is calling, saying, Africans unite. If one man fires the soul of black South Africans in a vision of liberation and a non-racial unified South Africa, it is Nelson Rolichlafla Mandela. This is New Location Deep Level, a dismal black township located outside Brunfort in the Orange Free State. For 50 years after its formation in 1912, the African National Congress operated as a non-violent movement, organizing passive resistance campaigns against unjust apartheid laws. In 1960, the ANC was banned by the South African government. With the Rivonia trial in 1964, the internal wing of the newly formed underground movement, Umkonto We Sizwe, the spear of the nation, was crushed, and the majority of the ANC leaders were sentenced to life imprisonment for planning to commit sabotage. For the past seven years, this ghetto has been the home of South Africa's first lady in exile, Winnie Mandela, wife of Nelson, banished by the South African government out of sight and out of mind of society. Age 66, Nelson Mandela serves his 23rd year in the maximum security prison of Polsmoor, outside Cape Town. When I married him, I was already a prisoner, in fact. Uh, we met during his prison trial, and uh, he had to uh, get permission, in fact, to get married because he was not only a prisoner, he was banned and uh, the trial was on in Pretoria at the time. So he was given four days in which to go to the Transkai and get married, which is where we got married, on the 14th of June, 1958. Well, I have lived most of my life alone. The best years of my life, really, have been those spent under burning orders, and the past, of course, uh, seven years have been spent here in exile. Um, exile here means virtually really being in prison at your own expense. And it is the extreme isolation that is uh, very, very difficult. And uh, being away from friends and completely isolated intellectually being in a place like this 
where you can hardly interact intellectually with the community that one finds extremely difficult and of course worst of all was being without my children and not having the opportunity to play the role of a parent like all parents in democratic societies virtually both of us have really not had that opportunity to to be parents to our children and the future do you believe you will see liberation in your lifetime Oh, certainly. That I'm completely convinced of. Um, that is why uh, even exile is so worthwhile, because I'm absolutely certain that uh, we shall attain our liberation. And even being in exile, really, is a constant reminder of the sickness of our society, and that we are virtually in prison, even in our country. Those who are outside, outside prison walls are simply in a bigger prison because the black man is virtually a prisoner and all those other fellow whites and other groups that are as oppressed as we are we are all really in prison in a bigger apartheid prison december the 10th 1982 is international human rights day the morning after the south african onslaught on masiru the silent vigil by the black sash South Africa's enduring civil rights movement is a haunting reminder of the diminishing human rights of 75% of South Africa's population. The central tenet of the International Human Rights Declaration provides that no one shall be arbitrarily deprived of his nationality. This declaration was prompted by concern over the withdrawal of Russian nationality from some two million political dissidents by the Stalin regime in the 1920s and by the termination of the German nationality of all German Jews by Nazi decree in 1941. In pursuit of the logical conclusion to the grand apartheid design, that ultimately there will not be one black person with South African citizenship, eight million black South Africans have thus far been denationalized. This is the central issue in the black man's struggle for survival in the land of his birth. Dr. Ntato Motlana, chairman of the Soweto Committee of Ten, founded in 1977 to oppose the Puppet Urban Bantu Council and to set up representative civic associations in the black townships. I want to add a different dimension to the proceedings of this morning. I haven't come here to pray. Those who brought us the Christian religion those who have made us pray for 300 years have now jettisoned that religion. They now worship ethnicity. Mm -hmm. They go to the churches every Sunday to pray to the God of racism, mm -hmm. to the God of ethnicity. Mm -hmm. We sick and tired of praying to that God. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying you shouldn't pray. We blacks are a very religious people. I'm just saying that isn't there another message to the story of Maputo, to the story of Maseru, another message. Here we are faced by a so-called Christian people who shot men and women and children in their beds. In their beds, brothers and sisters. There was no fight about it. There was no hot pursuit about it. I am saying the dimension I want to add to this morning's proceedings is whether in fact the South African army are they saying finally to our young men and women that stop wasting your time going to these monuments to Jesus Christ that the religion or non-religion or non-religion of the East that Marxism in fact teaches you and offers you something better. Amanda! Let's think about it. Amanda! Amanda! With its renewal of the armed struggle against the South African regime in 1977, 
the African National Congress has shown considerable restraint in avoiding soft civilian targets. With the determination of the South African government to seek a military solution to resistance to apartheid, a situation of escalating violence seems inevitable. Every peaceful means those who thirst for freedom have tried have ended up violently. And the nationalist government's answer to peaceful negotiations is violence. So tragically, uh, it does seem that uh, a violent situation in South Africa is inevitable. I am one of those, and I, I dare say I speak for my people, that uh, we shall see the future South Africa as a non-racial society, which is what we are prepared to give our lives for. We firmly believe in our own Bible, the Freedom Charter, a document that has been uh, drawn by the people of this country, uh, which in fact is the future constitution of this country. This country belongs to all who live in it, who have made it what it is. It is a pity that that has to come about in a violent manner. Bishop Desmond Tutu, provocative and outspoken opponent of the apartheid system. Veteran campaigner for peaceful change in South Africa, he has been awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for 1984. But now we live in this extraordinary country that the same event which has filled us with anguish, which makes tears stream down our faces, that same event in this country made others it made others shout with glee. It made others say, hey, we have won a great victory. South Africans who had gone to kill fellow South Africans think that that is something for which they ought to congratulate themselves. <laughs> what, is, what, what is going to happen in this country? Now you see, my friends, I, I, I'm finishing, and I'm finishing by saying, we have warned the South African government, and we want to warn them again, that if apartheid is not dismantled, then we are going to have a bloodbath. And no one wants to make such a prediction. Friday, May 20th, 1983. At 4.30 p.m., the African National Congress detonate a 50-kilogram car bomb in a crowded Pretoria street, catching hundreds of people in a barrage of flying glass and debris. Eyewitness reports reveal the horror at the scene of this naked terror. Dismembered bodies and maimed and dying people lay scattered along the pavement, in shops and in the street. I saw people on fire and others literally flung through the air. People ran around in a daze, colliding with each other in their scramble to get away from the burning cars. From inside, screams of agony and cries for help mingled with the sound of the crackling flames and the sirens of oncoming ambulance vehicles. A woman, her face and body a mangle of flesh and blood, pointed a distorted finger to the sky and groaned her agony. In this, South Africa's worst onslaught of urban terrorism, 19 people are killed and 217 injured and maimed. In retaliation to this outrage, the South African government reacts in the only way that it knows how, with the mailed fist. Three days later, on Monday the 23rd of May, an estimated 10 South African Air Force Impalas, armed with missiles and cannons, devastate six targets 14 kilometers west of Maputo, reportedly killing 64 African National Congress exiles and six civilians.
By exercising military might and economic manipulation, South Africa forces the neighboring black states of Lesotho, Swaziland, and Mozambique to severely restrict the presence and mobility of African National Congress exiles in these territories. Despite this restricted access, sabotage and bomb attacks inside South Africa continue. Internally, the conflict intensifies as military might is used to reinforce police activity in suppressing uprisings in the black townships in protest against continued black oppression and rejection of new designs aimed at ensuring black exclusion from the political process. Overall, the picture is one of escalating conflict and violence as prophetic warnings continue to go unheeded. Because, you see, people like ourselves are one day going to be pushed aside. The people are going to say nonsense. Those leaders, they keep talking about peace and our people keep getting killed. When, when people try to fight against this system, they are detained without trial, they are banned. Let me tell them that I believe, I believe fervently that if the government were to say today, yes, we want to dismantle apartheid, I can say almost without fear of contradiction that our people who are fighting outside would be ready to lay down their arms because they, they took up those arms for one single solitary reason, to get South Africa liberated. And I offer, I'm offering to the government, I'm offering to the government that we in the churches, if they like, I, I would be ready to act as a broker if they really wanted to set up negotiations. Because there are only two ways to freedom in South Africa. The one way is through sitting down and talking, which we say, let us do. The other, and there is no middle way. I, all this is nonsense. I'm going middle way. There are only two options. We either talk or we fight. And I am still saying, we want to help you, South African government, South African whites. We want to help you to talk. We want you to be alive when freedom comes. Because, get me, because, because we, I, we are going to be free. You know, I, mean, I have said before, and sometimes maybe we don't believe it. I have said there is nothing, absolutely nothing that can be done to stop us from being free.